Okay, so let's start with um, who you are and what you do, and how did you get into the nonprofit space? Yeah, I kind of got into it by accident. Um, I was an undergraduate student at Rutgers University. I think we share the same alma mater. Yes. R U R R A. Um, and I was really bothered by the fact that if you were in the university bubble, the businesses, um, the housing there was really nice, but if you went three blocks in any direction, it felt like you were going to a third world. And so um, as a college student, I felt kind of powerless to do anything about that inequality. And what I found is I got and talked to more people and spent more time outside of the campus bubble with that there was a lot of people who were running small businesses as a way to get by. And we're talking about really small businesses. So imagine your handyman, your hairdressers, your street vendors. Um, and these were things that if they were able to grow, if they were able to get a little bit of capital, a few hundred or a few thousand dollars, they could grow those businesses and create sustainable sources of income for their families. Um, and so I founded an organization while I was an undergraduate in college to address that issue. It was supposed to be very local, place-based in New Brunswick. And we grew over the course of a decade to serve um, thousands of people and lend tens of millions of dollars. So you were not actually powerless as an undergraduate. You turns out you did an amazing thing and sort of started a thing that I'm sure you at the time had no idea what it would become. You know, it was it was the original idea was it was just going to be a student-run organization. You know, we'd kind of pass it on to the next generation of student leaders. Um, and then I graduated. I had this job offer to work on Wall Street, and you know, we had made about 40 loans right at the time I graduated. And then um, two weeks before we had won a business plan competition from the Rutgers Business School, and we got $25,000, which was a lot of money at the time. And so my co-founder and I looked at each other and we said, well, we could probably pay each other like $1,000 a month for a year with this money and see if we could turn this into like a real thing, a real organization, a real company, a real job. And so I turned down the Wall Street job offer and here we are. You, you made the right choice. No offense so. to any Wall Street people yeah. in, the, in the audience. Um, <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so what was the name of that organization? I was the Intersect Fund. Okay, the Intersect Fund. And, but now you're a senior consultant at Axion. Yeah. So how did Intersect Fund intersect with Axion? How did that, I'm sure that's a joke you've never heard before. No, yeah. first time yeah. actually. <laughs> so about halfway into founding the Intersect Fund, we realized how important technology and data were gonna be to us scaling. We started in just a single city, and then we grew to a state and then multiple states, serving people all over the place. We realized that technology was gonna play an important role in helping lower down the cost. There's a reason that banks don't make $3,000 loans for street vendors to buy inventory, because it's too costly um, to do so. And so uh, about four years in, we started building a platform called Abacus, which was the first platform for automating microfinance in the United States. And it did everything end to end from you know, finding people, um, taking applications, assessing their credit worthiness, um, offering them a loan, closing it, servicing it, um, so we get paid back, sending them payment reminders. Um, and so we became a very unusual nonprofit in that half of our team was engineers, and then the other half was salespeople. And so we didn't have a lot of like, <laughs> fundraising and administrative pieces and things like that. And so um, about a year ago, I got to talking with the CEO of Axion, which is one of the two biggest names in the world in microfinance, Axion and Grameen, both founded in the 70s and 80s. Um, they have microfinance affiliates all over the world. And um, we put together a deal for them to acquire Abacus in February 2018. And so now this platform is working at a scale that is 20 times the size of what it was at Intersect Fund. Amazing. Um, that's, uh, that's incredible. And so just to dig in on the microfinance piece a little bit. So you said that uh, banks don't give $3,000 loans to street vendors. Um, what it, like, I, I frankly have no idea. What is the sort of minimum small business loan that, that banks will, will generally give? Most banks won't go under $100,000. Maybe you can go down lower if they're talking about it's really a small business credit card. Yeah. But the financial system in this country, especially lending, is really based around your credit score, the FICO score. Uh -huh. And so we were serving a lot of people who are immigrants, who are new to the country, who are working outside of the formal financial system. So they didn't have a credit score at all. They never applied for credit. They didn't have a bank account. Yeah. And so what our innovation was, was figuring out ways, because our hypothesis was that these people were actually very good risks for repayment, but there just wasn't enough data about them out there. And so formal financial institutions shied away. And then over the course of lending $30 million over the course of 10 years, we had a 99% repayment rate. Which is something that you'd think that banks would have been interested in, in acquiring you at a 99% re repayment rate. I mean, it seems like you, you guys were bringing together 
sort of two things. One is the sort of microfinance model that I think a lot of people are familiar with in the international space where people are giving really micro loans, right? Um, you know, everyone from Kiva to, to, um, to the Grameen Bank and, you know, these, these folks working in microfinance. And then also some of the innovation that we see in the, the fintech space where people are trying to build better models for understanding, you know, credit risk. Um, not necessarily for nonprofit uses, but just to better assess risk because if you can better assess risk, you can give loans uh, to the right people and, and have them pay it back. That's exactly right because, you know, for me, it wasn't as interesting to find ways to make loans to bankable businesses a little bit cheaper, a little bit faster. That's not yeah. something that's going to get me up in the morning. But to be able to enhance access to a broad group of people, I mean, many of you may be familiar with the kind of typical international microfinance story of you give someone a loan and then they buy a goat or a cow and then that becomes an asset and they can sell the milk um, and that provides income from the course of the year. Well, um, we tried back in 2009 New Brunswick. It turns out no one wanted money to buy a goat. Um, but the closest thing we have to that in the US is something like a food cart, right? So in um, cities where street vending is allowed, you can buy a food cart for a few thousand dollars. That's an asset. You know, there's, it's not that hard of a business to run. Like everyone buys their materials and inventory from the same place. You, everyone sells it for the same amount. You just got to find a good location and you can make a really good living. Yeah, and, doing that. and a halal card I better, is better than like trying to sell goat milk on the street and it runs like, yeah, that wouldn't, I don't think that would fly. You, you would know, right? I would know, I live there. I, yeah, no, <laughs> didn't buy a lot of goat milk uh, while I was in New Brunswick. Um, okay, so, the, so then, so you said Axion has been around for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think you said when we were talking before that, that Axion has been doing sort of microfinance in the US since the early 90s. Yep. Um, and so how are they using data to understand sort of credit risk and understand their, their impact how is that already happening? Yeah, so I think at Axion they had an abundance of, of insight and a dearth of data. So their model was kind of predicated on people who were very experienced in a particular territory with a particular type of businesses. So you'd have lenders that were with the company for you know, 10, 15 years. And so they could just kind of have a conversation with someone and assess their character. But it became challenging as they wanted to scale and Axion has set, set a stake in the ground. They want to grow. 5x over the next five years, um, that as you bring on new lenders, it's hard to teach that kind of assessment. And so wh what they wanted to do was retain that same access, retain that same social capital, but also have a model that was not just high touch, but also high tech. That completely makes sense. Yeah, 5x in five years, that is a, that's a sizable goal to yeah. be chasing after. And so they, I mean, that, what you're describing very much sort of aligns with that like small bank model, right? The, like, uh, Jimmy Stewart movies of, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we know everybody in the community. Yeah, well, he can't, you know, he, he doesn't. It's a wonderful life. It's, yeah. a wonder, it's basically, it's a wonderful life, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, that, you know, but that doesn't scale that easily because, you know, uh, if you're not in a small community and you don't know your community deeply, you're not, you haven't been there for 15 years, it's harder to assess that risk. And so you, have they been already using data in some ways or is it really just reliant on that first person uh, sort of reporting? Yeah, I think Axio, and like most non nonprofits, is very used to counting outputs. So outputs are like how many people that you saw, how many loans that you made, the total dollar amount that was lent. But I think for Axio and like many nonprofits, the holy grail is actually outcomes and impact data. So what is the effect of that loan on that business, of that family? Like were you able to actually grow their revenues you know, over a period of time, were they able to create jobs? Did they hire more people? What's the survival rate of those businesses over five years compared to the national average survival rate for businesses? Um, and that's where actually like nonprofits had challenges because they didn't have the systems or the infrastructure way of collecting and analyzing and storing that data over time. And that was really important because without that kind of data, how do you know if you're really achieving your mission? Right, yeah, I mean, the, what you're talking about is, so our founder, Lloyd, he talks a lot about vanity metrics, right? And you know, uh, if you're in the nonprofit space, vanity metrics are actually important because they're what you go back to funders with and say, yep. here are our top lines, look at all the numbers of people that we served, look at the you know, amount of loans that we gave out, and unfortunately, funders often, that's what they're interested in, but if you really want to get better and say, oh, these kinds of loans are actually having a much bigger impact, we want to do more of that um, and fewer of these kinds of loans, that's really about outcomes and that's much harder to track. Yeah. And, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that that's right and that, you know, as a nonprofit, I don't know if there's any 
nonprofit data nerds in the audience, is that you can't go into this thinking that you're just going to measure the data so that you can raise more money, right? It so rarely works that way, right? I mean, the funding community is not a pure meritocracy. You have to go into it from the idea of, like, I have questions that I want answered, right? And I want to be able to figure out how to ways to increase my impact, how to serve more people, um, and that's what it allows you to do. And so now that Axion has acquired Abacus, now that you are uh, working there with your, your team of engineers, mm -hmm. now that you have Looker coming in, what do you foresee over the next six months, year, um, in terms of what are your goals, what are you trying to, to accomplish? Yeah, so we just launched the first module of Abacus on September 4th okay. for Axion, which was a, a big milestone for us. We're working on a number of new projects. One of, the, one of the ones that I'm really excited about is we're building a machine learning model that can help us figure out what interventions are the most impactful when someone has fallen behind on their loan. Right? This is all often the dirty side of microfinance is collections. I actually really love collections, which is weird. Why am I a nonprofit guy talking about being a debt collector? But for me, collections is really where your mission hits the road of, OK, you, you've made a loan to someone. They're having some kind of trouble. Usually it's not that they're just you know, irresponsible or trying to run away. I mean, there are people out there who are trying to defraud you. But usually it's that they're, they're running some kind of problem. And it might be outside the business. It could be a, a medical problem because they don't have insurance. Um, it could be a housing problem. And so when they have that situation, the kind of intervention that you provide, and whether it's you're providing advice, whether you're meeting them face to face, whether you're referring them to other resources, whether you're altering the terms of the loan, sometimes we actually make another loan to people who are behind because that's what solves the problem that allows them to be successful. And so we've never really had a way of tracking, well, what is it, what interventions work in order to make business is successful. Yeah. And so now, so we, we've just built this model that's starting to ingest all the data of all the contacts and the referrals that we do. And so we're hoping that over time, this will actually help us be able to predict what things we can do to create those outputs and impact that we yeah, want for our customers. Interventions that, that then fix the problem or, or address the problem as early as possible so that it is still in a place where you can get them back on track before they're sort of fully in default. <laughs>